get a call late one night in April 1995 that my nine-year-old godson, Andrew, who's also my nephew, attacks a little girl on the baseball field for no particular reason. And I'm on the phone with Sherry, my sister-in-law, going, excuse me? She said, Danny, he's different. He's mean. He never smiles anymore. I went into his room today, and I found two pictures that he had drawn. One of them, he's hanging from a tree. The other picture, he's shooting other children. Andrew is Columbine, Sandy Hook, Aurora waiting to happen. And I'm like, I want to see him the next day. And they drove from Southern California to Northern California. That's where we had our first clinic. And I'm like, Andy, he's sitting on the couch in my office, and I love this child. I'm like, honey, what's going on? And he said, Uncle Danny, I'm mad all the time, and I don't know why. And I'm like, is anybody hurting you? He said, no. I said, is anybody teasing you? And he said, no. I said, is anybody touching you in places they shouldn't touch you? And he said, no. And my first thought is, you have to scan him. And then my next thought, because you know, we always are talking to ourselves, is you want to scan everybody. <laughs> you know, maybe it's because he's the second son in a Lebanese family. You're the second son in a Lebanese family. And then all of a sudden, the rational voice in my head said, stop it. Nine-year-olds do not attack people for no reason. Scan them. If his scan is normal, then you can play the psychological game. And so I went with him and held his hand while he held his teddy bear and got scanned. And this is the picture that came up. Andrew was missing his left temporal lobe. And I looked to Dr. Paldi, my mentor, and I'm like, the heck is that? And so his mother wouldn't hear. He writes down cyst, stroke, tumor. And we got an MRI that day, and he had a cyst the size of a golf ball occupying the space of his left temporal lobe. Now, I'd already correlated left temporal lobe issues to violence, and I called his pediatrician here in Orange, and I said, you find someone to take that out. And he's like, got it. Two weeks later, he calls me back. He said, I talked to three neurologists. None of them said they would operate on him, that his cyst probably had nothing to do with his symptoms. I'm like, are you nuts? He, I said, tell me more about symptoms. They, they said, until he had real symptoms. So let me see if I got this right. I have a homicidal, suicidal boy. What are you waiting for? And he's anxious because I'm mad. And he's like, well, I think they mean seizures, or he loses consciousness, or he has speech problems. I'm like, are you nuts? And I called a friend of mine at Harvard who's a pediatric neurologist, and she told me the same thing. And I'll bet you today she still hears me screaming at her. And then I think to myself, neurologists, neurosurgeons, neurosurgeons do things. And I called the pediatric neurosurgery department at UCLA, and I talked to a doctor by the name of Jorge Lazarev. And you'll know Dr. Lazarev. He's famous. He separated the Guatemalan twins who were connected at the heads, remember? Well, he was famous to me before then, because when I told him about Andrew, he said, I'll take it out. He said, whenever cysts are symptomatic, and he's obviously symptomatic, we'll take it out. And they did. And here is Andrew after the surgery. And after the surgery, I got two phone calls, one from his mother, who was so excited. She said the surgery went really well. And when Andrew woke up from surgery, he smiled at me. She said, Danny, he hadn't smiled for a year. The second call I got right away was from Dr. Lazarev, who said, oh my god, Dr. Amen. He said that cyst was so aggressive for Andrew. It put so much pressure on his brain that it actually thinned the bone over his left temporal lobe, that his temporal bone was eggshell thin, and that if he would have been hit in the head with a ball, he'd have been killed instantly. Either way, he would have died in six months. 
And it was at that moment I lost my anxiety about imaging. How do you know if you don't look? 999 psychiatrists out of 1,000 would have medicated him and or put him in psychotherapy. They wouldn't have looked at his brain. And a year later, Andy and I, and now I'm passionate. I'm on fire. You can't shut me up. And a year later, we're snorkeling together in Hawaii. And, you know, Andy's got these big, brown, beautiful curls. And after we get out of the water, we're having something to drink together. And he looks at me with his beautiful brown eyes. And he said, Uncle Danny, we're a spiritual family. He said, why did that happen to me? And I went, oh no, because I knew why it happened to him, so that I wouldn't be afraid anymore, so that we could do this work and change this very stuck profession to help real hurting people, because that's really always been the goal. How do you know unless you look? If you don't look, you hurt people, and that's not fair. That's not science. That's not medicine. It's stupidity. We can do better. So when you think of, when I think of the single most important lesson I've learned from 87,000 scans is you can literally change people's brains. And when you do, you change their lives. But if you don't look, you hurt people. And that's not fair. Thank you.